the tie, so all squared away in a very, very good seven-match series. I mean, where did you live in South Africa? They had closed the gates, everyone was stuck inside. And I said, how are we going to get out here? And I had the sponsored Volvo car, and I'll never forget, I had Mike Brock, I had Peter Kirsten, they were all in the car, and Both was with me, and I rode up to the gates, and I pushed them slowly. There was this big iron bar across there. So I drove up slowly, and he said, get out of here. I said, what are you doing? And he reversed the car, and he just put his foot down, and he went straight into these gates. They flung open. God, I thought, sponsored car, if he breaks, is what they're going to do? Anyway, there was nothing wrong with the car. The gates flung open, and we drove off. So... That was one of the nights, uh, yes. and that was playing South Africa, yes. so it was great. Well, as you said, 1978, you made your, uh, your debut for Northamptonshire. Your batting form is absolutely uh, prolific. You certainly had settled in on the pitch. Uh, it took you a bit longer to settle in, uh, in real life in England. But when it came to internationals, when did the England call actually come? Um, four years afterwards, so 82, um, I got the call up. To, to play for England. There was a lot of talk about it and a lot of controversial. The papers said I shouldn't be picked because I was South African and they were going on. So so it wasn't as easy as, as just being picked. And, and then the big problem was in 81, they had the Rebel Series uh, in South mm. Africa. So all of a sudden those players got banned and, and the guys were very anti it. And I could, I could understand. All of a sudden you're getting boycott, gooch, uh, and various other players being banned and all of a sudden a guy come from born and bred in South Africa just qualified <laughs> for four years steps in to play for the England side so yeah. there was a lot of bitterness and I felt that when I started playing I um, have been told that I'm just like every other county player um, and if I perform and score runs uh, I stand a chance of being selected for England And that's squeezed away once again, there's no third man, so Alan Lamb gets off the mark in his first test match, first ball with the boundary. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. Lands into it so gloriously. Long, long chase there for Park, all to no avail. And I'm showing his true class here. And one of the classic shots in this game. Beautiful off drive there. You and, uh, and Ian both of them had uh, certainly similar styles on the field of play. Is it fair to say you had similar styles off the field of play as well? Well, yeah, that's why we got on so well. Um, I wasn't so aggressive of him off the field. I think if there was a frack I probably would be the first one on top of the banister. But, yeah. um, no, I think the, the three guys I, I felt fitted in straight away and it uh, was David Gower and uh, uh, Ian both and we both had the similar sort of approach to the game. We enjoyed it um, and enjoyed uh, relaxing afterwards. You know, we liked the, the same sort of style, you know, going to wine bars and going to wine farms and, you know, enjoying the country where you go to. Mm. I don't know if you enjoyed New Zealand or not, 1984 uh, and, and that tour, but certainly that was the tour that made all the tabloid newspaper headlines for all the wrong reasons with, with you and Ian, both of them. Was that difficult to deal with, Alan? I mean, OK, you, I know you've got a larger-than-life attitude, a cavalier attitude, but you still have a job to do, you have a family life to look after, and it, all this is emblazoned across the newspapers. Yeah, I think that was hard. Oh, no, I, I, don't get me wrong, I think New Zealand's a great place to go to. Um, I think it sort of all went wrong um, uh, out there because I think what had happened is Elton John was, was uh, sort of a great cricket lover so uh, what he was doing is um, he would come see the game and then we would end up going to see his concerts in the mm. evening um, and then all this sort of uh, uh, stories came out that the England team had been smoking pot in, in Christchurch in the dressing room and that's why their door was closed and that's why they got bowled out in a day, if you work out the hours, we would have been bowled out in a day. I think we got 97 and 98, but it was a rain effect, so it sort of spread out. Um, you know, all these sort of tall stories started breaking out, and um, I think it just got worse and worse. And then I think it was the year that the, the, the Sunday, the Mail on Sunday started. So it was their sort of first year. So um, there were a lot of fabricated stories out of that, but, um, you know, I'm not saying that... Uh, uh, they were all uh, wrong. Uh, as I say, there's, there's no smoke without fire. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think probably there were things that we probably shouldn't have done, uh, which we did. 
Um, and probably in hindsight, you look back and say, well, you know, we were a public figure then. We probably should have been a little bit more sort of uh, discreet in, in what happened out there. But uh, I think uh, it, it just mounted. And I think that's what really, it was that 84 that really just changed the whole um, the game, you know, our relationship with, uh, with the media. Um, because we were having sports writers and they used to sit and drink and come to parties with us and that type of thing. And all of a sudden, their editors were saying, hold on, you better give us the stories. And they said, hold on, we're a cricket writer, we're not a freelance writer. Or a... So all of a sudden, there were these load of freelance writers coming on tours. And so that really cut it down. So there was this real mm. sort of yeah, I think, friction. I think it's being... important that the, the public understand that. There is a certain honor amongst thieves, as it were, because they're, they're the, there's the press pack that follow either the football teams or the cricket teams, the golfers, or whatever it happens to be. And then there are the showbiz writers and the news reporters yeah. and things who are looking for different headlines. They're not there to cover the match. No, no, no. They're, yeah. they're not interested. But I, I think basically that well, that's the way the world's gone. And I think '84 changed the whole way of our touring system. You know, we we couldn't really go sit and have a pub, have a drink. Otherwise, you know, they'll say he left at 11 o'clock, but no, he was sort of there at mm. one o'clock. And uh, so it it just got worse and worse. And so what you didn't do it anymore, or you just didn't invite the reporters with we you just anymore? Didn't <laughs> <laughs> we didn't invite the reporters with us. So uh, we had to do things behind closed doors or at someone's house, or you know, when we had a party, we had a few ales and that. But I think where it changed is that, you know, we could have a big night and, and yeah. still perform the next day. And I think the game seems to change. I don't know what it is, but uh, no one seems to have a big night anymore and play the next day. Yeah. I thought you were more relaxed than facing Michael Holding at <laughs> sort of 80 miles an hour with a few beers in you. <laughs> you felt a bit more confident, you know. And he's got it away. He's got to take two and will do so. 100 to Alan Lamb. He's the first man in the history of Test match cricket to score three centuries against the West Indies in a series in this country. I wonder how much and you captained England three times, I think, in that in that season. Yeah. And then in '92, you lost your Test place. Now, why was that? Well, I think that '91, '92. There's a little story with that because. Um, I had a great record as an England captain. I captained England three times and lost three times. So it's a 100% record, really. Okay. <laughs> uh, I used to always used to take over if Graham Gooch was injured. So I was vice captain, so automatic took over. But uh, in the, the, the first, um, we, when we captained, was in the West Indies. Um, and, and that was great. We were very unlucky not to sort of square the series. I don't think we would have won it. And then we went on to Australia. And um, that was, uh, we'd done well against Australia, we'd bowled them out, we had, we had a lead of about 20, and then we went into bat and lost two wickets early on, and I was still not out. And um, uh, the phone went, it was Tony Gregg, saying that Kerry Packer would like uh, David Gower and myself to come up and have a drink with him. But Kerry Packer doesn't drink at the time, so we ended up in his suite in the same hotel we were staying, and, uh, all the drinks were laid on and we were sitting and we were long chat about World Series and why they, they used the white ball and that. Then he said, listen guys, you know, will you come and have a meal with you? And I said, hold on, I'm not out. David Gower's out. So he's sort of free. I said, no, he said, we won't be long. We'll just nip down to the Gold Coast. So they had all the chauffeur cars. So off we go down to the Gold Coast. And uh, we ended up in um, this hotel where the casino was. I can't think of it now. It'll come. And we ended up sort of having a meal. i never forget he ordered the Chateau Lafitte 63 and caught on Montrachet and I thought, well, this is unbelievable. And I ordered, I wasn't very hungry, I just had a few prawns and that. Anyway, he called over the waiter, he said, you can't give a man three prawns, get some more. And this was a lovely French restaurant. So anyway, he was sort of a very aggressive guy. And so the, the waiter brought us a load of prawns and I had a lot and I had a nice sip of the red wine. And then he said, I hadn't even finished my start. He said, right, we're going gambling now. So, you know, you <laughs> had to get up, everyone. I looked at Tony Gregg and uh, his son, Packer's son, was there. And uh, anyway, we all got up and I, David Gahan and I were eyeing a bottle of 61 Lafitte. We said, we can't let that go away. So we left the table, sort of walk off, and we quickly got, and swigged the glass of that was, and put it back because no one was sort of, could take their drinks because there were no drinks in the casino. Right, anyway, right. he had his own sort of 
table and yeah. security there, back the wives and girlfriends were there. He said, no one, don't have any girls playing. He said, yeah, he gave them 100 or 500 dollars and said, you just go away. We don't want you interfering. Mm. And anyway, we got around the table <laughs> in this. And uh, away we went, sort of, he said, everyone in. I said, hold on, I'll just watch. So he said, no, this is the way we'll play. We'll use my money and whatever's won, we'll share. I well, said, well, I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, How do you get invited yeah. to one of these? <laughs> so uh, anyway, the game got underway, and there was an incredible amount of monies going. You know, he had the whole box, and he was dealing the car. You know, they had the dealer, and him and his son were sort of shouting what was going on. Eventually, we were, I think, all up about 12 grand. I thought, this is fantastic. Great. This is going to pay for my whole trip, you know, because in those days, you had to fly your family out. You had to pay for the accommodation in the hotel and that the board never paid so I thought well this will cover it really great anyway he sort of said well you guys want to carry on and it was about 12 o'clock then and I said no listen I've got to get back I'm not out England captain yeah, I'm yeah, quick while you're ahead <laughs> anyway the boy said no no we'll just go on for another half an hour I said okay half an hour half past 12 I've got to leave and anyway we went on well we lost everything in half an hour the lot had gone anyway we climbed in the old uh, cars and off we went back to so I got back in about probably about one o'clock, quarter past one, and went into the hotel and went to bed and uh, went out to bat and I was out about the third over. Anyway, headlines, Alan Lamb seen leaving casino at 6.30 in the morning. Well, this is how, again, this all erupted again. So I said, well, listen, I'd left it so and so, this was the situation. But just to say how these stories go on. Probably it wasn't the right thing to, to be there, but the thing was, we hadn't even had a drink because Pack had sort of got up and gone. I think I had about three sips of wine, so probably that's why I failed the following day. <laughs> well, you, I mean, the story's amazing, but uh, basically the selectors had had, that was it, you were, you were history now. I, I ended up, you know, uh, sort of still playing as vice-captain, uh, but the end of the season, when we came back, we were playing against Pakistan, um, and that's when the, the ball case started. Uh, and I'll never forget the first sort of test the match. The ball tampering. The ball tampering. And then the first test match, um, normally it was taken that I was vice captain, nothing was said, and, you know. And then all of a sudden the media came to me at Lords and said, hold on, you know, are you sort of vice captain? I said, well, as far as I know, yes. So they said, oh, well, Ted Dexter, we've spoken to him that you're not. So anyway, I went and spoke to Gooch and Graham said to me, well, haven't they told you that you're no longer vice captain? I said, no, I, I didn't hear yeah, no one said anything to me. So then it started sort of boiling up a little bit and, um, you know, a bit of soundness sort of came in. And then we had the, the ball tampering thing with, with the Pakistan bowlers, which, you know, I was fairly bitter. Not with the Pakistan.